if the goal is to make this a career income, I was there by five months. One of iTunes' best of 2015. Super humbled and grateful to be given that award. Did you miss me? It's been a while since the last episode of the Podcast Movement Sessions podcast, but we are back with great insights from that fellow, Aaron Mankey. Aaron is the host and creator of The Lore Podcast, one of iTunes' best for 2015 and 2016, actually. It's about to be a major TV series from Amazon Prime and the producers behind The Walking Dead. And Aaron is going to become a name that everyone knows, not just us podcasters. But he's also a great example of how creating quality content can be a business all on its own. Aaron was a keynote speaker at Podcast Movement 2016 in Chicago, and he's joining us again this summer in Anaheim to share more of his story and success. But today, we're going to get some of the best parts of his talk from last year, as well as some insight into what life is like as a full-time podcaster and writer. No matter what label you wear or how your podcast fits into your life and business, Podcast Movement is the place for you. Join 2,000 or so of your podcasting pals as we learn about content creation, audio quality, editing and outsourcing, promotion, sponsorships, and everything in between. August 23rd through the 25th in Anaheim, California. Visit podcastmovement.com for more info, including how to take advantage of the payment plan and secure your ticket with just a little cash today. Okay, it's time for a confession. I've been listening to Aaron Mankey's lore for a little over two years now. It's a masterpiece of storytelling every two weeks, more often around Halloween. And it's one of my must-listens every time it comes out. But since March, I've been working entirely from my home, and most often alone in my home. So, frankly, Aaron is just too darn scary to listen to by myself. I realized that I had only been listening to lore on my commutes in the car between home and the office or while I was waiting to pick up the kids. Now, with no commute, I've got three episodes waiting on me because I can't listen without getting a bad case of the heebie-jeebies. They tried to help, but in the end, they did more harm than good. And while most of the people who suffered through that pain are long gone, the after-effects remain. And the stories they tell are horrifying. I'm Aaron Mankey, and this is Lore. As scary as his podcast might be, Aaron Mankey couldn't be a nicer guy in person. He's one of the great examples of some of my podcasting heroes that I've gotten to meet personally and actually build relationships with through the podcast movement conferences. Whether it's a handshake and a selfie in passing, getting to ask your personal question in the hallways in between keynote speeches, or whether it's just getting great information like what you're about to hear from Aaron, podcast movement is an amazing experience. I'm Joel Sharpton, and this is the Podcast Movement Sessions podcast. So I did this thing last year. I got to month five. I was supporting myself through podcasting and getting sponsors and growing the income. And I thought, 2016 is coming up. What I want to do I want to see if I can sell all of my 2016 spots before the year starts. And so I did the math. I do three sponsor spots per episode. They're all post-roll at the end. I dictated the terms and said, I'm not doing mid-roll. I'm not doing pre-roll. And then I do every other week. So 26 episodes times three, 78 spots. So I had 78 ad spots to sell, and I sold them out in two weeks. It was crazy. And what this did for me is it let me look at 2016 and say, I'm not going to have to worry. This is my job now. This is my job. And now I can focus on the little things. I can tweak these levers. I can try this. I can do that. It bought me freedom. And then in April, we were able to go public. By month six, actually, I had multiple TV offers on my desk. I was looking at about two dozen different production companies that wanted to work with me. Because they thought that Lore was just this great intellectual property that could become something bigger on a screen. So I worked with a couple production companies throughout the months of the autumn and into the spring, and we were finally able to go public in April with the fact that um, the, the, there's two production companies. One is called Propagate. They're um, also responsible for, recently announced their, the first original content from Apple, actually. 
um, that's in development, and they're, they're the forces behind that. And then Valhalla is another company. They happen to make this little tiny show that nobody's ever heard of called The Walking Dead. And uh, Gail Ann Hurd, who's the, um, the president and the head of the company there, is, she's a legend in uh, the entertainment industry, probably one of the most powerful women in the industry, and I'm in fantastic hands. So all of that to say, this has been fun. It's been a lot of fun. So where did it all start? I'm going to tell you my story very quickly because uh, for two reasons. One is I think that people connect to story, right? I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I think a lot of you guys, you tell stories. So uh, we connect around stories. And stories help us in a couple of ways. One is that you're going to see glimpses of your own path and my path. And that's really encouraging when you can see that, wow, I've gone through that too. Or I've experienced that challenge as well. That's powerful. And then at the same time, you can look at where I've gone and say, I have hope. You know, I have a possibility here. There's encouragement in this. I was a freelance designer for about eight and a half years. I worked for myself from home. So in the grand scheme of things, I wasn't in cubicle land. I wasn't commuting an hour each way to work. My commute was up a flight of stairs to the third floor. But I was working for myself, and it's, it's a grind. If, are there any freelancers here in the room? Oh, man, you know that grind, right? You work your tail off all month long to pay the bills, and then at the end of the month, you do, and then your bank account's empty, and you have to start over. And I did that for eight and a half months. And while I was doing design work, I was writing. I've, I've been interested in writing since, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, fifth grade or so, always on the weird side of stories. I started writing novels a few years ago and self-publishing them. So the, the cool thing about self-publishing is you have complete control over your content. Who gets it and how much you charge and your royalties, your income possibilities are limitless. But you're also solely responsible for marketing your stuff. And I was not good at marketing, and I, w I did not have a platform. I had an email list of 66 people. So when I emailed them and said, I've got a new book out, and that happened once a year, maybe half of those people would buy a book. Three bucks a pop, 30 people buying, do the math. I can't, I'm not supporting myself through the writing. So I came to a conclusion that I either needed to seriously up that game or quit. Just give up writing, something that I had done for 30 years. So I decided to give away a PDF to people to sign up for my list. I wrote this thing called My Five Favorite New England Myths. And I wrote four of the five of them, just non-fiction, uh, historical details of weird, creepy stories from New England, which is where I live. And I wrote four of them, and I realized it was so long that I wouldn't have time to sit down and read it myself. And I, I just didn't think it was a valuable giveaway for somebody to give me their email address. So I, I literally like, dragged it over to the trash can. And then I stopped, and I thought, you know, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I'm an Audible fan, I love Audible, and I'm constantly digesting audiobooks that way. Maybe I could record these things in an audio format. Just put the MP3s in a zip file, and that's what people would get if they signed up for my newsletter. So I recorded one of them. And like a bad photo, and you jump into Instagram, and you throw a filter on it, and it looks good. The audio quality was horrible. My, my office is horsehair plaster walls and hardwood floor, and there's nothing acoustically treated about it. So I put some music in the background because it helped. And I sent it to a friend, and I said, all right, I'm going to give these away. This is the first one. What do you think? And he said, he said, don't do it. This is a podcast. I said, no, it's not a podcast. A podcast is like two people talking about a, an iPhone update, right? As a guy who listens to quite a few shows that are two guys talking about iPhone updates, I absolutely understood what Aaron was trying to say there. But... I also come from the radio world. I had been in the radio business for more than a decade before I started podcasting. So for me, the barriers to entry didn't seem that high. I asked Aaron why he was so surprised by the suggestion that this audio recording should be a podcast. Well, at the risk of offending people that I know in the podcast community, I'm going to give you an answer that's not meant to be offensive. So don't take it that way. It's just a, an illustration of my ignorance at the time. See, I think for a very long time, podcasting was a heavily tech-oriented medium, probably due to the fact that it was a thing that was mostly enjoyed by tech-savvy people. RSS feeds aren't really simple, as their name would imply. Mere mortals don't understand that stuff. My mom doesn't understand that stuff. And some of the oldest podcast networks that are out there today are tech-oriented. So when it was suggested to me by a friend that I release this thing that eventually became lore as a podcast, my first thought was, no way. And of course, podcasting has really grown into a powerful storytelling platform. And that's something I'm thankful for. It's given Lore a home. It's perfect for my goal, which is to tell great stories. 
basically that thing that I, the first thing that I wrote in that first one that I recorded was episode one. I just put it out there. In two days, I branded it, I built the website, I figured out how to get stuff in iTunes, I found a, you know, a hosting provider through Libsyn, like I did all that and just crash course two days, learned everything I could, and I put it up. It was an accident. Lore was an accident, all right? Um, but it was an accident that came at the right time. It came when I needed, I needed it. My income for my design business was going down. I wasn't selling books. I was making $5 a month selling paperbacks or, and, and e-books. $5 a month, and you're not gonna support your business doing that. So this came at a really good time for me. I needed this. And maybe that was the driving force behind what I've pushed myself to achieve. Maybe because I looked at this and I said, I have something here, something that I could actually turn into a job if I'm careful, if I work really hard, if I make smart decisions. And so that's where I was at. At the, uh, at the beginning of March last year. So I say all of that to ask you this question that I just want you to keep on your mind the rest of the morning. What's your goal? What's your business goal for your podcast? What is your financial goal? What, what, what's your aim here? Why, like, why are you doing the show? Other than passion, other than that you love the topic, other than you're an expert in the field, why are you doing the podcast? Just answer that silently in your head, file it away, and hold on to that. So. If you're here, you're in two camps, one of two camps. Either your show is hobby effort, okay? And that's what I mean by that is it just takes you a couple hours a week, two, three hours a week. There's also full-time effort podcasts. And maybe you have a show like this. It takes you 20, 30, 40 hours a week to put it out the door. And if you're working a full-time job and doing that, you probably don't sleep much and you're probably going crazy. And Lore, for me, was in this camp. Lore takes about 30 to 40 hours to make one episode. I made this conscious decision early on that I'll just do them every other week because otherwise I'll go insane. But I also had a full-time job trying to do design work. So we're all in the same boat. Where you get to the place where you say, I can only do this for so long. Either Lore has to go out the window or my job has to go. And I thankfully got to make the good leap, which was nice. So monetizing. This is how I make my money, okay? So I want you to hear a few things. This isn't the end-all, be-all list of all ways that you can make money, but it's how I make my money. The second thing that you need to understand is that I'm gonna give you some options, and it's not about picking your favorite. The, the key here is many streams make a river. A big river like the Mississippi is big because it has rivers flowing in from all different areas, and those rivers have streams flowing into them. The idea here is to grab a little bit of money a month from this, and a little bit of money a month from this, right? And you build all those pieces together. It's like stacking boxes so that you can climb out a window. One of those boxes that Aaron has started to stack recently is the Lore Television Show. Now brought to you by Amazon Studios, a full season has been ordered and it'll be coming to the Amazon Prime streaming service sometime in mid-2017. It may be available even before we get to Anaheim. But I asked Aaron, what's it like juggling the production of the Ongoing Lore podcast, the backbone of his whole business, and the new shiny, the TV show? Oh, it's a challenge for sure, but the core is always about story. I'm telling a story no matter where I roam, whatever medium I'm using. So an audio podcast or video TV or future projects that are in the pipeline, all of it is about the same story. And so as long as I'm writing and I'm getting my production requirements done each week, I feel like I can maintain some sort of a balance. But I I will be honest, I'm pretty much maxed out right now. I mean, the little things that I used to find time for, like fan emails and browsing the lore Facebook page, all those things are sadly gone. I had to toss those seats out of the airplane a few months ago in order to stay in the air. Things have just gotten really busy. But this is one of those moments where busy is really, really good. And I'm glad that I get to do what I'm doing. So, sponsorships, right? This is the big one. It's the elephant in the room. Everybody talks about sponsorships. If you don't know how sponsorship works, you're probably in the very, very tiny minority. But let me tell you, it's basically like this. You have listeners. Sponsors have money. And they're going to give you the money to access your listeners. That's pretty simple, actually. On a small technical side, they tend to pay by the thousand listeners, and we'll get more into that in a moment. So it works a little bit like this. First, you have to know how many downloads your show gets. The metric that I hear from almost everybody and the metric that I use in my show is how many downloads does one episode get in its first 30 days? And that's an easy thing to track. Just look at your episode stats and figure out how many downloads did that episode get in 30 days. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is that it's expensive for these companies to manage sponsorships. 
Think about somebody like Casper, giving out mattresses, sponsoring a ton of shows. They're really good at sponsoring, like being the first sponsor on a show. You'll often see a show that you love, take on their first sponsor. I can almost put money on it that it's gonna be Casper because they like to take risks and try those out. To sponsor 20 shows means that they have a, somebody in their company who has to receive invoices, they've gotta handle the tax documents, they have to communicate with the hosts, they have to do all these things to make the sponsorships work right. And the more and more shows they take on, the more and more work it is. So not only are they paying that check to the podcast host, but they're also paying the bookkeeper and they're paying the accountant and they're paying all of these people to manage this stuff. It's expensive. So there's a trend that I see happening in sponsorship companies right now. And that is that they're shifting away from doing lots and lots of tiny shows. And they're doing more focused work on a few larger shows. And they've drawn a line in the sand. The metric that I think that they've drawn that line at, this is just anecdotal, it's what I've heard from conversations and in my own business, is 50,000. If that one episode gets 50,000 downloads in its first 30 days, you're in the right territory to reach out to sponsors and make it worth their time. So, second thing. Most sponsors, like I said, they pay by the thousand. It's called CPM, cost per milla. Milla means thousand, so it should be CPT, but I don't know, that sounds like some sort of a disorder. So CPM, cost per thousand, and it's a rate. It's a dollar amount that people will pick. You know, and, and it, it happens through negotiation between the host and the, the sponsor company, but it's basically somewhere between $5 and $25. The rate that gets charged is usually dependent on how effective that those spots are on the show, how tight the connection is between the company and the audience. So if they're getting more leads than they ever expected, they're probably gonna pay more in a CPM rate the next time they book the show. If they don't get as many leads as they expected, that CPM rate might have to go down for you to still book them. But basically just consider it this flexible number that reflects how effective their investment into your show has been for them. Focus on sponsorships with companies that fit your audience. You're gonna feel this desire when that first company reaches out to you to take the check. But if they're not a good fit for your show, they will hurt your show and they'll hurt your business. Don't sell just to sell. There's two reasons why a bad fit is bad for you. The first is that company is gonna get a really low return on investment on their paycheck to you for that sponsorship spot. And if they don't get what they were expecting, they won't come back and now you've burned a bridge. And a bad fit also means that your listeners are gonna feel sold to. The people who listen to your show have a specific set of interests centered around your show, but then the topic of your show, and then the things that are connected to that topic. Focus on companies that fit into that realm. Because if you don't, your listeners are gonna feel like you've just crammed an ad in to cram an ad in, and then they're gonna feel like you're shilling to them. So make sure that you pick companies that fit your podcast well. So at this point, it's basically just really simple math. You've got your 30-day download total for one episode, and let's just say, for example, it's 50,000, okay? And since we're dealing in thousands with CPM, you cut off the last three zeros and it's 50, and you have a multiplier. And then if your CPM rate that you've negotiated with your sponsor is say $10, then 10 times 50 is 500. And what that means is that you can charge relatively confidently 500 bucks for a spot on one episode of your show. Now think about that. Let's say you do a weekly show and you've got two ad spots. That's $4,000 a month from some simple math and some hard work of building your audience, right? But it adds up. Things snowball. Second thing, crowdfunding. Do I have to define this? It's when a crowd funds your thing, right? <laughs> and we can think of a few different ways that this works. I break crowdfunding down into three categories. There's one-time campaigns, there's the recurring campaigns, and then there are those no reward, one-time random donations. So one-time campaigns, you always think of the big dogs. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, there's other places, but these are the, the big names on the list. So the way Kickstarter works is you create a project. It's the thing that you're going to raise money for. You're gonna ask the crowd to fund it, and you set up rewards. If you give me X amount of dollars, then you'll get this thing that I'll give you. And then if you give me a little bit more, I'll give you a little bit more. It's a one-time donation for a one-time reward scenario. The payments escalate, the rewards escalate. It's very simple, you've seen it all the time. People use it for all sorts of things. Now, here's my warning with, with something like Kickstarter. If you have a show and you're trying to build a recurring income, a one-time campaign probably isn't the best way to go. If you have a show that works in seasons, something like The Black Tapes, you know, I've got friends over there, or uh, my friend David Cummings at the No Sleep Podcast, you know, they do seasons with their shows. You see this all the time. You could, in theory, kickstart a season. 
raise the money, use the money to fund the production, release the episodes. And then when season two is ready to start work, you could kickstart that season and then rinse and repeat. But it's pretty clear that Kickstarter and Indiegogo and places like that, they're good for a one-time campaign. You know, Roman Mars used it for one of the seasons of 99% Invisible. I think he used it the second year to launch Radiotopia. And he's been very clear, and a lot of other people have been clear to say it's awesome, but it's good for one-time campaigns. So just know where your show fits into those needs when you're picking the place to do your crowdfunding. The other way would be recurring uh, services. There's places like Commit Change and Patreon. And I use Patreon. They've got a booth here. Talk to them. I love the idea of a recurring crowdfunding system because what it lets people do is say, I love this and I want it to be part of my life. You know, and that's a really powerful thing. People get behind that. And so it works the same way, right? There are dollar amount tiers that people can support you at and there are rewards that come with them. Same thing. They hand over their money, you hand over a reward. The difference is that it happens monthly. On the first of every month, Patreon starts charging all of my supporters on their credit cards. It's there and it's set and it's eternal until those people unsubscribe, which allows me to look at a number on a web page and say, I'm going to get that at the end of the month, right? I can, I can start to plan finances around that. I can see if I can pay my bills with that. So it's a powerful tool. Now, the thing that I need to warn you with, not just with Kickstarter, but also with Patreon, is the reward part. You've got to be careful when you're making rewards that you make them easily fulfillable. I see some shows and it's all physical rewards. Somebody was joking with me the other day about like a boy band who would say, for a dollar a month, we'll send you a signed postcard every month. Really? That's going to cost them like 80 cents to do that every single month. And that's not counting their time and the energy that it takes to do it. Because we all have three limited resources, right? Time, energy, and money. So you have to think about what you're going to deliver to people. I give people digital uh, rewards for their support. They get extra episodes because I learned early on that what people really just wanted out of lore was more lore. So I give them lore extras. I didn't call them more lore because it just sounds weird. My show comes out every other week, and it's in those spaces in between, those Mondays that aren't release days, that I give it a smaller extra episode. And that's the big draw. Most of my supporters, if you look at where they're broken down, fall into that $5 a month category where they get to get an, an extra episode in their, in their listening stream. Just think about how you can deliver things like that. Then there's the no reward, just the donations. This is when you have somebody who says, I can't afford to, to support you monthly, and you're not doing a large campaign. They just want to hand you a five. You know, they just want to walk up where it's folded in the hand and, and, and give you a handshake, and give you a 20 or whatever. So there's a difference between the first two options and then the donation thing. The donation options, you got places like Kickstarter and Patreon who are going to handle all the back end for you. They're going to take care of all of the payment processing, all of that. When you get to the donation part, you have to figure out a way to do it yourself. You have to figure out a way to put a button on your site where people can click and then enter their credit card information. So look into places like PayPal. You know, they'll let you set up a, a button on your site. It's not the easiest system. Maybe they're getting better at it, but PayPal is usually a little user unfriendly. I tend to use kind of a concoction of features. There's a place called Stripe, stripe.com. They're payment processors for credit cards used all over the web and in apps. They're very, very trustworthy and they're a solid company. And I can take the API number from, from Stripe and I can plug it into Squarespace, which is what I build my site on. And that turns on my commerce section, and I'll get to that later. But it also turns on the donation button. So when I want to put a donation button on a page on my website, I just drag the button on and it's done. It's that simple. Think about who's going to fulfill your donation payments when you do that. And then product sales, right? We always think about products. I sell some things. I sell t-shirts. Um, you know, apparel is kind of the, the, the go-to um, place for a lot of people. It's, it's yeah, cheap and easy to get some shirts done. Because I've wrote novels before I started Lore, I sell those on my store. I sign them before they go out the door. If somebody wants my autograph on a book, I'm willing to you know, deface it for them. And then I sell things like stickers. And, I'm, and I slowly add to that. I don't want to overwhelm myself with lots of products. But there, there's some things you need to keep in mind about, about selling products. It, merchandise is an expensive game to get into if you want to do it right. So I've seen the places where you can set up a t-shirt design and people for two weeks can order, like pre-order them. And if you get enough pre-orders, it'll go to print. A lot of those places print in a method that I, I'm not a fan of the quality. It's a different type of method. I think it makes it easier for them to do short runs of things or do one-offs if they have to. I've received lore t-shirts from places like that twice and both times the logo has been over here not centered where it should be. One time it was over here and a little bit crooked, and I thought, how is that even possible? But So if you want to do merchandise right, if you want to put something in the hands of your listeners that they paid money for to support the show and make them feel good about supporting your show, take the time to do it right. So if you want to do t-shirts right, find a local screen printer. 
But again, it's expensive to get into this game because if you decide that you want to do one design and you want to offer it in men's and women's sizes and you want to offer it in small, medium, large, extra large, and double XL, I get asked for larger sizes and I've been asked for extra small and I just, I've limited it to five. But that's 10 SKUs, right? That's 10 different shirts for the two genders. And then you want to have enough of them on stock to fulfill orders. So let's say you ordered 10 of each. Well, now you have 1,000 shirts you have to buy. And at anywhere from eight to $12 a pop, that's a really large expense to make. And now you've got to store them, right? You've got to keep them somewhere in your basement or your house somewhere. And now you're in the fulfillment business, right? So now you're taking orders and you're packaging things up and you're going to the post office and you're doing all of that. So you just, you have to remember that when you get into product fulfillment, it's, it's expensive on a lot of levels, okay? So make sure that you're ready for that, that time commitment, the energy that it takes, constantly keeping up with that. How are you gonna fulfill orders if you take a vacation? It's really tricky. I use a concoction of Stripe for credit card payment, plugged into Squarespace to turn on the commerce, and then I have an account with stamps.com, can you believe that? <laughs> They're a fantastic supporter of my show. Um, stamps.com owns a website called ShipStation, which you basically connect the two of them and then ShipStation connects to Squarespace. What it means is I don't have to let my helper log into my Squarespace site and access the commerce stuff and then literally highlight and copy addresses out and paste them into stamps.com and then print on a paper label. What ShipStation lets you do is it funnels the orders in and it funnels the postage in and then they just click and it prints a label and I've got a thermal label printer which is like my favorite toy of the year. No ink cartridges and it doesn't smear and you just tear that off and you, and you stick it, it's adhesive, you stick it right on the package. I mean, you have to think about this stuff, right? As your orders get bigger and, and more frequent, you have to figure out, is this the, the logical way of handling it? It's probably one of those, of course, duh, but think about it. So find a web system that works for you, and I've ever said that I use Squarespace. Now, product sales can be outside of those realms, too, right? So think about things like live show downloads. If you, if you have ever done a live show, record it. Record it, because fans have not been able to get to that show and sell it for a buck or two on your website. I like Squarespace because it lets me sell physical but also digital goods, so I can, I can kind of dabble in that. If your show has valuable transcripts, maybe it's in the answers that guests have provided on the show that you want people to be able to read or use a quote from, or maybe you pre-write your material like I do because I write everything ahead and then I record my show. Maybe your transcripts are valuable and you could sell those. I use my transcripts as Patreon rewards, but they could very well be a five pack in a, as a digital download PDF and you can make them pretty. Hire a designer for a couple of hours to add some color and some nice layout or something. And then maybe you could even sell unreleased content, content that won't go into your RSS feed. You could actually just package it up and sell it on your, on your store. So think outside the box. Think about other ways where you could sell something that might not mean that you have to spend an hour every night in your basement packing up cardboard boxes, right? And then there's this realm of premium content. Premium content is basically allowing people to access content that people can't get without paying for username and password to access it. So you see this on membership sites and um, paid archives and things like that. It's a private paid RSS feed. Some of the ways that I've seen this work, um, there's a show called Script Notes. Two Hollywood screenwriters who talk about their craft, they, talk, they interview other screenwriters. It's fantastic and they've been doing it for about five years. So they have uh, 250 episodes in their catalog, but they only have the last 20 of them available on iTunes. Similar to what a, This American Life does, but This American Life really, really limits that window of episodes available. So what they do is they say, you can listen to the most recent 20 here on our stream, but if you want the rest of them, they're in an archive and you can pay us $4.99 a month. You'll probably blow through the whole archive in a month or two and then you'll stop subscribing, right? So it only costs you 10 bucks to access everything else, but you've just supported the people who made that show. So think about that. If you've got a show with a really, really long history, hundreds of episodes, consider taking a portion of that, slicing it off, and making it a paid archive that people can access. You can also create unique paid-only content that you can put into your stream, and uh, you could create ad-free versions of your content and have that in the stream as well so that people will pay to not hear your sponsors. You're gonna get paid either way, but that way they can get content without the advertisement in it. Uh, and there are solutions for this. Go talk to Libsyn right out the door. They've got a solution where you can have your normal stream and then you can turn on a paid stream and they'll handle everything for you. They'll handle all the payment transactions, the membership details, all of that. If somebody's payment bounces, they'll take care of that. If somebody is cranky because something didn't work right, they take care of that. It's super, super easy. There's also a website called Nanacast 
where they're meant to sell a lot of things, but, but paid RSS feeds is one of those. Um, and then a similar product to, get, to Nanocast is Get DPD, which stands for Digital Product Delivery. Those are just places you can check out and, and kind of use them uh, for those features. And then there's the miscellaneous, right? The other services, the other little things. I've talked to people today and yesterday and the day before who they don't have a big show, but they're experts in their fields. And so what they do is they have their small audience, but then they sell their services through consulting to other people. You know, that they're an, they're an expert in finance or they're an expert in lawn care. And so they're able to sell their services. And that's essentially podcast income, right? Because the listeners of the podcast said, oh, I need to ask him some questions. I'll buy an hour of his time. I'm going to pay her on a recurring basis to coach me through the startup of my business. Things like that. Those can be income sources for you. Think about podcasting services, right? Maybe your show is small, but you're a damn good audio editor, right? And so you could, in theory, offer your audio editing services to podcasters who aren't good at audio editing. There are a few of them. And Sorry, that's not a, that's, yeah. And I suppose this would be the part of the podcast where I plug my services as a podcast editor, producer, and consultant. I asked Aaron what his favorite and least favorite parts of the podcast production process are while he's making lore. Hands down, it's setting the mood. Stories make people feel things. The emotion, the tension, the drama. And I love helping that along with deliberate editing. It's certainly not the sexy part of storytelling. It's not the plot. It's not the character. But it's the essential element that helps take a story from good to great. Editing, just like in a printed book, is essential. <laughs> My least favorite part? I'm still on the honeymoon stage, man. I love every bit of what I do for this show. While you were skeptical of fitting lore into the podcast format originally, once you decided to, were there any narrative podcast, fictional podcast that you were listening to at the time? No, all of that actually came after launching lore. Honestly, once I realized that podcasts could be used for storytelling, I thought, hey, what other shows are out there? So I started to explore. There were a lot of good shows back then, two years ago, but even since then, the landscape has simply exploded with storytelling podcasts, and it's amazing. After the success that you've had with lore and the explosion of the storytelling genre, how do you feel the podcasting medium fits storytelling like yours? Honestly, I think it's perfect. Oral storytelling, probably the most ancient way for humans to tell each other stories, is a perfect fit for podcasting. You just need a voice and a story to tell. And maybe that's told through an interview like this, or through investigative journalism like 99% Invisible, or straight up storytelling like my own show. No matter how you tell them, if you want to tell stories, podcasting is a great medium. And then the last little bit here is live events. And you see this with big shows, but I think that little shows need to try it. So I use Libsyn for my hosting. One of the cool things you can do with Libsyn is you can see the geographical area where your listeners are at. And so I can look at like my top 10 metropolitan listener bases. That's probably a really good tour list, isn't it? Go where your listeners are and do a live show. You can make money at a live show. 200 people show up and they pay you 20 bucks. Do the math. It, it's, it can work. So live shows are another way that you can generate some revenue. Those are just some of the ways that I earn money in doing what I do for a living. I get to add TV to that list, but for the most part, it's just all writing. It's writing, it's advertising, and I think that anybody can try those things. So I have some simple rules. Your mileage may vary. These are the mindsets that I try to, to maintain while I'm running my business. So as you're trying things, as you're dabbling, see if you can stick to these rules. Number one, diversify your efforts. Many streams make a river. Don't try sponsorships and then say, oh, it didn't work, I'm gonna quit. Well, did you try product sales? Did you try crowdfunding? Try putting the pieces together because 500 a month here doesn't pay the bills, but when you add that 500 to 200 here and 500 here, and it, it starts to add up, all right? Remember the 1% rule. I made this up, you've never heard of it before. It's the 1% rule. This means that your listener base, your Twitter followers, your audience, your Facebook fans, take that audience number and what's 1%? That's how many people will respond to a call to action. It sounds super pessimistic, doesn't it? Super pessimistic. But I've got this rule in business, which is always assume that my expenses are gonna be high and always assume that my income is gonna be low because it prevents me from overextending myself. And then when I overextend myself, I'm either in debt or I'm disappointed. So I follow the 1% rule. The 1% rule says that if you tweet something powerful like, oh, go download this free giveaway, 
1% will retweet it, 1% will download, 1% will buy, 1% respond to a call to action. If it's more than that for you, fantastic. Learn to think in net 60. If you get into the sponsorship world, it's really exciting to mail out that first invoice or to email it over. Yes, I'm gonna make money. And then the check doesn't show up. And then the check doesn't show up. Remember that sponsors tend to pay on net 60, which means it takes them 60 days from receiving the invoice to sending you the check. It varies from company to company, but for the most part, it's gonna take them about two months to get the check to you. I paid myself this month from ads that ran in April. It's crazy when you think about that. At the end of this month, I'll invoice all of my sponsors and I won't see that money till September. But that's the way that you have to think. You have to, when you get into the sponsorship world, think of your income on a delay. And you might have to build a spreadsheet that tells you, okay, I invoiced it this month, but this is the month that I'm gonna get the check. So you can plan your finances. So just keep that in mind. Learn to love your stats. I'm obsessive about stats, but I think that if you run a business and if you have a podcast that you want to be your income source, you run a business. You need to know your numbers. It's really nice when somebody emails and says, hey, I've got this company, I'd like to pay you money to be on your show, that you can respond intelligently and with the right numbers so that you can make the deal the right way. Remember how I said I pre-sold all of 2016 before the year started? That was a really cool thing, but it was also dumb. It was really stupid because my download numbers, that 30-day total, is twice what it was in November. So if I had sold Q1 and Q2 of this year and then stopped and waited for the numbers to pick up and then sold Q3 and Q4, I'd actually make more money. So knowing what your number is, that 30-day download total, is helpful for pricing out your sponsorships the right way. I track a few things, my 30-day download total. I like to track, I, I get that this is a really weird problem, how many days to each million download mark? Uh, it's 13 for me right now. Every 13 days, there's another million. I track how many downloads per month, because I want to see, I'm looking for growth, right? I'm taking a pulse of my podcast. And what it lets you do is, if you make a dramatic format change in your show, and you're paying attention to your stats, you will see the effects of that format change in your stats. It might go down, it might go up. If you're not looking at your stats, you're blind, right? You're not paying attention and you can't adjust. So I look at my numbers because it helps me be smart about the decisions that I make. Mind the taxes. Remember, if you go full-time freelancer, you are a self-employed person. No longer do you have a boss to pay half of your social security. 15.3% in the US is what you're gonna pay on your money as a payroll tax to Social Security. So you'll pay federal income tax and state income tax and then 15.3% in Social Security tax. That means that figure out the money that you need to have in the bank account at the beginning of each month to pay your bills. Take that number and multiply it by about 1.75. And that's how much you should be invoicing out so that when you do get the money and you put a little here for federal and a little here for state and a little here for social security, you have left over the right amount. If you invoice out four grand because you need four grand, you won't have four grand, you'll have less. You need to invoice out seven grand to have the four grand to spend. It's depressing, isn't it? When they take 40% of your pay, it's depressing. But you've just, you've got to plan ahead for it, okay? You don't want to get to the end of the year and realize, crap, I need to come up with $12,000 to pay my taxes. Nobody wants that. Keep costs low. This is connected to the taxes and it's connected to all of it. If you're spending money on lots of things each month that you justify as business expenses, you'll have less to spend on your bills at the end of the month. Because again, this is about freedom and us paying our bills so that we can do this for a living. There's a lot of very tempting products. And what you want to do is pick and choose very, very carefully because those $3 a month, $9 a month, whatever, they add up really fast. So just be careful. Be organized, and that applies to everything that I've said. Be organized with your sponsorship schedule because you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to put the wrong sponsor in the episode this week. Be, be organized with your stats. Be organized with all of your record keeping and your business and your taxes and all that. Just, just be organized. I'm an obsessive compulsive person. Not everybody is. Please, in this, try to be organized. And number eight, be consistent and be professional. And you might look at that one and say, what does that have anything to do with making money from podcasting? And I'll tell you. There's two ways that I think people need to be consistent and professional. Number one, be consistent in your schedule. If you say your show comes out every week, put it out every week. Put on your big boy pants and be responsible. If your show is every other week, release it every other week. Don't miss the beat. Here's why. Your fans, they depend on that schedule. They set their life's clock to your schedule. They know on the second Monday, they're gonna get that episode from me. And they plan for it. It's queued up and ready to go on their commute. And if it's not there, 
they now have bad feelings about me. All right? And you do that enough, and sp uh, 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 people who listen to your show just stop listening. They'll hit the unsubscribe button. All right? And the other way that you need to be consistent and professional is in your quality, in your content. I mean, you can grow, you can improve, but, but don't be all over the board with it. Put out good, consistent, quality content. Because if they expect this from your show, and then the next week you deliver that, and then the week after that, it's a mix of the two, and they don't know what's going on, you've got 10 minutes of banter between people at the very top of the show before you ever get into a topic, like they don't know what to expect, they'll stop listening. And when you lose listeners, your CPM number goes down, right? The math gets hurt, and now you can charge less for your sponsorships, and now you might have to go get a day job. I think it's really important for people who have a podcast that they want to be a business to treat it like one. And that's, that's my general rule for this. Treating your podcast like a full-time job is the best way to turn it into one. You get it? Treat it like it's a full-time job. It's the best way to turn it into one. And that is exactly what Aaron Mankey did. Now, not all of us are going to be as successful as Lore and Aaron have been. Not all of us are going to have an Amazon TV show in our future. But Aaron does. I asked him how the Mankey family was handling having a celeb podcaster in the house. Or have they even noticed? Oh, I hate that word, man. Celebrity? I'm not sure about that. I mean, Chris Pratt, he is a celebrity. Harrison Ford? Celebrity. Me? I basically stand in the equivalent of a blanket for it in my office and talk into a microphone. And I don't really know that there's anything glamorous about that. Um, but my oldest, she's uh, eight years old. She loves to tell her friends at school that her daddy is famous. I'm using heavy air quotes there. Um, maybe someday I'll find the way to tell her and break her heart that I'm just a guy who talks into a microphone. And that's about it. But, uh, you know, as far as what it's done to my life, you know... Except for maybe the travel, uh, they love this. I, I work for myself. I work from home. Doing the thing that I've dreamt of doing for most of my life. It's a dream come true. And I, I don't know of a family out there that would have a problem with one of their own getting to do what they love to do for a living. And I'm grateful every single day that I get to do that. And I am very thankful to get to do this. I am really enjoying being your host and producer for the Podcast Movement Sessions podcast season two. And folks, we've got so much more to announce in the coming weeks. Next episode, we're going to be focusing on the Podcast Hall of Fame and the new inductees for 2017. Uh, but talking about folks who speak into a microphone, there's a lot of names already announced at podcastmovement.com uh, to join Aaron Mankey at Podcast Movement 2017 in Anaheim. Folks like Dan Carlin from the Hardcore History Podcast, Chuck Bryant with Stuff You Should Know, Cliff Ravenscraft, Jesse Thorne from the Max Fun Network, Grammar Girl, Mignon Fogarty, and me. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to be speaking at Podcast Movement 2017 as well. I'll tell you about my session next week on the Podcast Movement Sessions podcast. We'll have more announcements for you next week. My thanks to Aaron Mankey for this week's episode. Until next time, I'm Joel Sharpton. And this has been the Podcast Movement Sessions. 